Santa Fe and Ultra Air by Santa Fe is happy to be partnering today with our longtime collaborator, Corbett Lunsford, whom you may know from YouTube's Home Performance Channel and the public television series, Home Diagnosis. Okay, fantastic. Thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy day. I know we've all got stuff to do, even if it's just sit at home and think about the fact that we're trapped at home. Um, I am trapped in a construction site that I am building for my family. I've got a, a house that I'm using all of the principles that I'm going to teach in today's uh, webinar, which is going to be about 45 minutes, and then we're going to ha have time for questions. I have built a uh, small house before. This is my first big house. I also am a beginner at this. I've only been doing what I do for 12 years. And having the strength of a beginner uh, means being able to raise your right hand. Everybody do this with me right now. Raise your right hand, repeat after me. Sometimes I am an idiot. It's okay. There are no dumb questions. You cannot possibly know everything about buildings or homes or even just one specialty. I used to be a musician. Uh, and a performer, and so I come from a different field entirely, and I bring kind of the, the thought behind how to think about music into buildings, and it's all about the dynamics and the flows and the kind of, it's very interesting. So anyway, please stick with us. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, I have a television show called Home Diagnosis that's on PBS. It's for free. You can watch it on YouTube as well, our YouTube channel. I am the author of a book uh, that I'll show you in a minute too. So essentially, all we're talking about is the invisible dynamics around us. And I am not talking about feng shui. Uh, feng shui may be perfectly logical and it may actually work. I do not know, that's not my expertise. What I do know is that we've got three things that are constantly moving and working and changing around us inside. And that includes inside, obviously, homes, which is what we're gonna focus on today. It also includes in schools, your work, vehicles, things like that. So you got first, physics. Most people are familiar with the idea of uh, thermodynamics, even if it's just something that you remember that heat goes from something that's hot to something that's cold, um, which works for outer space, it works inside your house, everything is the same. Essentially, physics is basically like weather systems inside your house. And I've got a much more in-depth version of going through the physics, again, on our YouTube channel. There's going to be a lot of stuff that I'll just say, hey, you, you should research later uh, if you're interested. But that's not all that's happening inside your house. Also, or, or home, and that includes apartments, and even if you live inside of a tiny house on wheels, like my family does, chemistry is the second thing that is happening inside your house, whether you like it or not. You don't have to believe in this stuff. In fact, let's just say like science is so politicized right now that there may be people out there who say, I don't believe in chemistry. Fine. You don't have to. Um, it happens whether you like it or not, which is very, very dangerous for most people um, for reasons that I will get into in this session. So physics and chemistry are not all. We also have life happening around us, and that is microbiology. There are billions of animals, single-celled organisms, bacteria, viruses, um, fungi, living around you right now. They are on your skin. They are in your body. They are on your walls. You are not the only person who lives in your house. There are all these other things that are also like eating and sleeping and working. They're doing things and they're having babies and, and that's all very interesting too. And it does have an effect on our experience of homes. So first of all, everything that I'm about to talk about is based in not building science. You may have heard the term building science. That means theory. That's like based on principles of, oh, well, thermodynamics says that this should happen if this happens or moisture should go here. I honestly... I don't lean too heavily on that. So there are times when you have to, but I am an expert in testing. This is what I do for a living now for the last 12 years is I go into people's homes and I find out what is happening. I simulate weird uh, events. I can put 20 miles of, an hour of wind on every surface of your house at the same time. Uh, I can uh, find out how your HVAC system is working. I can find out how your dehumidifier is working. I can, we can find out exactly what chemical cocktail is in your air and whether there are mold farts and mold BO in your air, like crazy stuff. You're, you're able to find out basically anything, any of those invisible dynamics you can test. So the whole principle of everything that I'm talking about now is if you are not testing, you have no idea what's going on, period. If you buy a house that's a new house and you say, can I have the test data that backs up what you're saying about it being green or energy efficient 
or healthy or whatever, whatever. Um, first of all, know that there are ways to manufacture um, misinformation that might even be accidental. It's not that people are trying to fool you. It's just that people just have no idea what's going on right now, which is why we're talking about this um, in this platform. So this is the book, Home Performance Diagnostics. That is the guide to how to test things in homes. And I, <laughs> nobody had written that. I didn't invent any testing. Uh, this stuff is as old as I am. I'm 40 years old. I'm 41. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, but this testing is as old as I am. I just basically codified it in a book and you can uh, preview the whole thing online if you want to. I do, my goal is to make sure that people use this around the construction industry. So in order to get normal people on board with thinking about the home as a system, and everybody repeat after me, the home is a system, my home is a system. Say that to yourself every time you're about to spend money on your home because one product is not going to fix things. If we're talking about something like a dehumidifier, which Santa Fe Ultra Air makes fantastic ones of, I have two of them that I'm installing in this house that I'm sitting in right now. I could take that wonderful piece of equipment and install it and it might not work at all because it's not a standalone, it's not a silver bullet. You have to put it into a system that will treat it the way that it is designed to be treated. And so you have to t think about tuning, if we're talking about music, tuning the system of your home so that everything is in harmony. And the main two things that we're talking about are the enclosure, which is the air sealing and insulation layer, and the engines, which are things that move heat or air or moisture around. So all these companies came on board and helped us build the highest performance tiny house on wheels in the world. I still live in that with my wife and our two daughters and our two cats. It's sitting right outside the house that I'm building. We live in Atlanta now. And we toured this around the country. We went to 34 cities. Um, we spent a day in a lot of them, but we spent a full week in 20 of them. And we would do daily, as you can see by the picture here, daily tours, people would line up. If I came into your town and said, hey, do you want to learn about building science? Or do you want to learn about uh, home cam? No, no you don't. Uh, do you want to tour my tiny house on wheels? Heck yeah, you do. So come on in. And then we would basically explain, this is the best house you've ever been in, period. No one can argue with us because I have all the test data of what is happening in this house right now to show you that it's doing exactly what it's designed to do. Most people don't have that data, but it's very easy to get. And that's the whole theme is we wanted to get people hooked on the idea that a house can be very quiet, which it was. Uh, it can be very comfortable. It can work perfectly. People who are allergic to cats would come into the house and after 10 minutes, they'd notice our cats and say, oh my gosh, I have a deathly allergy. How am I not dead right now? I've been in here for 10 minutes. I didn't even notice. This is what we're talking about. So also to this point, we're trying to get the message across uh, on television because if it's not on TV, people don't believe it. So we're talking about things like dehumidifying and things like chemistry of the indoors and microbiology and things like that on PBS. Now, this first season is airing on over 60% of the stations across the country, which is weird because no one has ever made a television show like this. It's basically science and homes at the same time, which HGTV doesn't want to have anything to do with because basically it would tell them that uh, all the other shows on their channel are um, not for real. So these are the companies, and I hope that you do take note of all of them. Santa Fe Ultra Air, obviously, is one of the founding sponsors of this television show. But all these companies agree that it is just better for the entire construction industry in the world if people understand that no one product is going to solve their problems. We need everybody to understand that if you're buying a house, which is the most significant investment you'll ever make in your life, you need to... Make sure that as a system, it's tuned and it's not going to do things like, you know, potentially make your kids sick. And I can just stop there because I don't even need to give you a second reason to pay attention to the rest of this presentation. Um, that's an important thing. And these two little girls that are my kids, I know for a fact that they will not be made sick by this house. And I know for a fact that this house will last for 100 years. And those are things that are like, that's a very interesting thing to be able to do, especially since I am not a home builder. I am an idiot. I used to play piano for a living. I think I told you that. So this is the kind of thing that is very doable. And if you just basically learn the language of how to talk about this, then that's how we, we move forward with the construction industry. So this is the house that I'm sitting in right now, and we can. I'm happy to take questions about it. But if you haven't seen this house, there are over, I think now we're over 100 videos of the construction of this house. I'm building this with my mom and dad. Everything you see there, except for the concrete foundation, was built by me and my mom and dad. Not rocket science. Um, very airtight. I have a dehumidifier in the house running right now while it's under construction. 
There's all kinds of special things going on with it. But really what we want to talk about today is the concepts that the house is like the physical embodiment of these concepts that I'm going to talk about. And just to show you that it's for real and that you can use it, that's why you go to our YouTube channel or the television show and check it out. But Home Chem was an experiment and it ran for uh, one month on this house on the left here. So the house is basically a double wide trailer. There's nothing special about the house. What they were trying to do with all of the equipment that you see in the top right, which was installed uh, in the kitchen area, plus four trailers that were parked around this double wide trailer full of four and a half million dollars of gas chromatographs and mass spectrometers and lasers and particle counters and all kinds of things. They were basically trying to do more research in one month than we have done indoors for the last 20 years. And that comes from one of the people in the bottom right picture, Rich Corsi is, is a researcher of home chemistry for the last 20 years. And he was like, this is, this is the most important study that has ever happened on homes. And what we're trying to do is essentially figure out how to help families, um, whether they needed help. And it turns out that like they definitely do, which is why you're here. So there are three numbers that you need to be aware of. And I just want you to look at these for a second and think about what they might be. You might think, oh, maybe that's degrees, like 79 degrees and 70 degrees and 50 degrees or something like that. It has to do with dew point or uh, dry bulb temperature for those of the <laughs> building science nerds in the audience. Uh, really, what this is, is years. 79 years is the average life expectancy of a person in America. That's men and women average. 70 of those 79 years you will spend inside of a building and if we and if we include vehicles then it goes up to 90 percent so 90 percent of your life you're going to spend indoors 50 out of your 79 total years that you're alive you're going to spend inside your home so to make sure that this point is made i'm a dad I know that there are issues with vaccines. Do I think that vaccines, because they have things like aluminum in them and you know, blah, 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 and that we've got a lot more of them now than we used to when I was a kid, um, and people are trying to make money and things like that, like, do I think that they might be introducing some issues? Yes, of course I think that they might be a thing because it's impossible for you to say that a medicine is gonna have the same effect on everyone in the world. That's total lunacy. However, we have not been looking at the indoors when we say, Things like kids have obesity and ADHD and uh, uh, all kinds of different learning disorders and all this stuff, and it must be vaccines? Like, that doesn't make any sense. It, it's probably to do with the fact that we're making houses tighter and tighter and tighter and introducing more and more and more chemicals, and which then introduce more and more and more microbiology, changing the physics of the house, etc. and we're not researching this at all. So what this experiment did, basically, was uh, put the house through a month of layered and sequential experiments, meaning that we would like just cook breakfast and then figure out what happened. Chemistry, microbiology, physics wise, that we would just clean or we would do what's called the Thanksgiving day um, scenario, which is where we like cook all day long with every burner we've got for six hours. And then we have 30 people in the house and we eat, 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 and then we clean all the dishes and then we leave and we find out how the house decays as far as all the chemistry and everything like that. So it's just these three things, cooking, cleaning, occupancy, had nothing to do with changing the HVAC or um, trying to change different paint colors or paint types or anything like that. It didn't have anything to do with the building. And as you can see, it was very well funded. The uh, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which is a major science education foundation, was the one who funded it. They're, they're not an industry group. So this was not about finding out that like, oh, the insulation is, is good and it's healthy for you. It was just trying to find out what is going on exactly. So this video i'm not gonna play this video for you right now but suffice it to say you can listen to me and as i've said i am not a scientist what i would rather you do is go to our home chem playlist if you go to youtube and you search home chem and by the way this stands for house observations of microbial and environmental chemistry if you search that you will find about 40 videos that we made where we put the camera on these scientists who were all wonderful people and they're very well spoken and they were able to explain what is going on and so you can hear us talk about it on the pbs show but frankly hearing it straight from the chemists is much much better so here are the basics number one chemicals there is no such thing as chemical free if anybody tries to sell you something and they say it's free of chemicals that is ridiculous 
everything is made of chemicals. We are made of chemicals. The air is made of chemicals. There is nothing on this planet that is not made of chemicals. So chemicals can be good. We are made of chemicals, therefore, yay, I I'm happy. I love my daughter. She's made of chemicals. I love chemicals. Um, but there are also chemicals, obviously, that can hurt you, right? There are poisons and toxins and things like that. And so there are some good, some bad. So what you want to do is control what chemicals are brought into your home and what chemicals are created inside your home. And this is critical for you to understand. You have chemicals that are in your house from things like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm standing right now on particle board um, flooring. It's, it's called oriented strand board. It's basically pieces of wood that are glued together, and that glue has chemicals in it. That's going to off-gas into my house. Yes, of course. Everything in your house is off-gassing a little bit. It's okay. Because some chemicals are good, some chemicals are bad. Some chemicals are neutral. But those chemicals are going to meet the chemicals that come in through the window. Like you open the window, and it's a busy day with traffic outside. A little bit of ozone comes into your house or you clean with a chlorine-based cleaner, or with vinegar, or you cook something with tomatoes in it or meat, and suddenly these molecules start meeting up together and reacting and having babies. And you are creating chemicals in your house that were not there to begin with. And that is critical to understand because it's not just about making sure that I don't bring anything bad into my house. You could bring all nice stuff in your house, but then when you introduce them to other things in your cleaners or in your cooking or in your personal products, your lotions and you know deodorants, things like that, they will react and make babies that you are not able to predict. So that's the first thing. Second thing is particles. Particles are always bad. Uh, anything that's a little tiny piece of something of a solid or a liquid that goes into your lungs, not going to be good for you. Your lungs are not developed to get rid of bad stuff. Your uh, digestive system has evolved over millennia to, if you get poison in you, it'll say, okay, well, I have options. I can make you throw up right now and get it out. I can get, I can make it go out the other way. I can send it uh, to the liver and sequester it, basically. I can do all kinds of different things, filter it out. So, so you have a bunch of different mechanisms if you eat something that is bad for you. But breathing it in, your lungs are babies. They'll just put it right straight through into your blood. Um, or it just collects in your lungs and it gives you something like cancer, which is not good. Particles are being created in your home. You cannot not do this. You will create particles, which are bad for you. If you occupy your space, if you cook in your space, or if you clean in your space. So the only way not to create particles in your home is not to live there. That's it. So what you want to do is control how many particles you're creating and where they are going to. And I will talk about specifics on how you do this. Number three is microbes, right? So microbial life is happening all around us. You can't avoid it. And in fact, you don't want to try and sterilize stuff. It's just like your gut. I've got some antibiotics that a doctor prescribed to me for essentially no reason. It was just like a safety measure. And I know what antibiotics do. They're going to kill all of the microbes in my gut. And then I will have to spend three weeks eating yogurt and drinking kombucha and making sure that I make my, my gut biome nice and healthy again. You don't want to do that with your house either. You want to make sure that you understand that your microbiome in your home can be healthy as well. And you want to encourage that. So genocide of all of these microbes is not the answer because in order to genocide your home's microbial life, you have to use chemicals. And now we've come full circle and now you're introducing more chemicals in the helm, which are then going to blah, 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 blah. So you can see that it's like all interconnected. So here are the big classes of contaminants. This is from a woman named Arlene Bloom. There are six classes of major contaminants that we need to be concerned about. So number one is highly fluorinated chemicals. These are things that are uh, waterproof, antimicrobials, flame retardants. These are things that are in all foam insulation, all of it. It was taken out of kids' jammies in the 80s, uh, something called uh, chlorinated tris, I believe. And um, they, they said, you can't put it in kids' jammies anymore because it's getting kids cancer and it's <laughs> mutating their DNA. Um, so they said, oh, well, what are we supposed to do with this? I know, we'll put it in furniture foam and in building foam. And so you can't really get around this. Anybody who says that they're building houses like their grandfather did, no way. They're either naive or they're lying to you because you literally cannot do that. The materials that we have today are not the same as your grandparents had. 
Bisphenols and phthalates are things that make plastics harder or softer, um, so they're easy to work with. If you have plastic, you're going to have some kind of a phthalate or a bisphenol. BPA is an example of a bisphenol. Some solvents and, and certain metals, don't worry about that too much. This is mainly just to get you introduced to the fact that there are things all around us. So they're present in the materials that are in your house. They're present on surfaces and in the air around you. So the more humidity you have in a home or any, any indoor space, the more emanation those things are going to have when they, they stick to surfaces and they're going to eject up into the air when humidity gets a boost. So humidity control is a major thing that we need to be thinking of when we're thinking of controlling the chemistry and the microbiology of homes and also the physics, but that's kind of obvious. At this point, we're kind of off the beaten path of what most people talk about when they talk about building science. So the more humidity you have, also the more microbial life will grow. And in fact, I just want to remind everybody that I, I, I'm not remind, maybe this is the first time you've ever heard it. I was surprised to know that some of the biggest farms in the world are in the Middle East, in the desert, because you do not need soil to grow plants. That's what hydroponics is all about. If you have sun and you have water, that's basically it. You don't need anything else. You can give them a little bit of vitamins if you want to, but that's they're, they're off to the races. So you could have microbes growing on antimicrobial plastic or antimicrobial uh, doorknobs, anything like that, because there's a layer of dust that forms on it if you're not cleaning regularly. And then the dust is not like antimicrobial and the microbes can sit right on top of that. So very interesting. And the last thing that's really important to understand here is that there is more pollution indoors at certain points. And when I say certain points, I mean when you cook or clean or occupy, then there is outdoors. And in fact, every single one of the atmospheric chemists that were involved in the home chem experiment were astounded at how astronomically higher the pollution is inside homes than outside. Another thing to understand is that there, nobody regulates this. Uh, and, and nor can they at this point. There's really no mechanism for it. So outdoor air pollution is monitored by the APA. And, and your city can be fined if it has too much smog. Food and Drug Administration monitors things that you put in your mouth that you swallow. Consumer Product Safety Commission monitors things that you put on your clothes, right? And that's going to monitor stuff like that. Occupational uh, air quality is monitored by OSHA. So that's if you're at work. So for example, any of you have a 3D printer in your house that your teenager uses all the time to make little doohickeys? 3D printers create a ton of very small particles. And these are things that can get deep, deep into your respiratory system. If you don't have OSHA at a workplace mandating that if you're going to have a 3D printer, you also have a, a, an exhaust fan right next to it to take those particles outside, who is monitoring that your child is building something all night long in their bedroom while they're sleeping and they're breathing on all these particles. So we can't really tell people what they can and can't do in their home. That's why we have educational events like this that really need to, to tell people about it. So the first thing you need to uh, be aware of is ozone is bad. Ozone is bad. Never let anybody you know buy an ozone generator. They are for sale. You can buy 300 and something of them on Amazon right now. They should be illegal, but they're not because you're supposed to be smart enough to decide when you need something like this. So we've got a couple different things. Particles and aerosols, as I mentioned, always bad. Ozone is the big bad villain that's the number one villain. It's the kind of prime mover behind all of this stuff. That comes from traffic, by the way, and also ozone generators, which you can buy for your house, which you shouldn't do. Hydroxyl radical is um, something that happens when ozone comes in and so ozone likes to react with things that have a carbon double bond. You don't need to know what that means. It just means something that's organic. So ozone is picky. It'll react only with certain molecules. But the reason that you might have a product that creates a lot of ozone, like think of any air cleaner that's going to have an electrostatic or a UV or an electronic component to it. If it is more than just a filter and a fan, it will create ozone in general. And when they test for ozone, they will find almost none. So they'll tell you, hey, this doesn't create any ozone at all. The reason that there's none is not because it doesn't create any. It's because as soon as ozone is created, it's going to find a molecule that it wants to mate with, and it's going to react away, and it'll disappear. You'll never find it again. So when it reacts, one of the things it creates is hydroxyl radical, OH. 
And hydroxyl radical is not picky. It will react with anything else that it finds. It does, it, it's like a you know frat boy. It just wants to mate with anything. Chlorine atoms, also very aggressive, very bad for uh, inducing reactions that will create weird things in your house. Nitrate radical is something that's kind of, these are just, this is like a very broad survey, but nitrate radical is really interesting because they only find it outdoors at night. It's like a vampire. When the sun comes up, it destroys nitrate radical, not NO3. In homes, it turns out that nitrate radicals are around all the time. And where they come from mostly is gas combustion. So if you have a gas stove or a propane stove or um, a gas water heater that might be backdrafting because the physics in your home are out of tune, you'll have problems with that. And excess humidity, obviously, which I've already mentioned. So particles, normally these are gonna be lower indoors, except when you cook. And whether you uh, roast vegetables, people are like, oh, hey, I'm a vegetarian. I'm not like uh, frying meat in my house. It doesn't matter. If you're cooking at all, even boiling, boiling is gonna create the least amount of particles, but it is gonna create some particles. Um, P, you got a couple different levels of particles. PM 2.5 means that the, particle, uh, the particles are uh, two and a half microns uh, or bigger. So, so a PM 2.5 filter will count things that are down to 2.5. That's very, very small. And that obviously you can uh, breathe in. Things that go uh, down to 2.5 are going to get caught in your upper respiratory system. So if you have a cough or a, um, aggravated sinuses or something to do with your like throat, that's going to be probably this bigger size of particle. Things that are smaller like PM10, oh excuse me, PM10 is bigger. These are like big things, pollen as a major example. They're going to fall down faster. But the, the two and a half, if you get down to like you know, a tenth of that, let's say 250 nanometers, that stuff can start going deep, deep into your lungs. And now you'll have lung problems as a result of that, because they're so small, they don't get caught by all the stuff in the way, your filtration system. So VOCs is something that you've probably heard about. Um, paint is the main thing that this was a big deal about. It's like, oh, oh VOCs in our homes, that's bad. Uh, first of all, anything you smell is probably a VOC. What a VOC is, is a, uh, a molecule that was in the solid state and it evaporated into the gas state. So a, vo a volatile organic compound is what it means. It's a, just a compound of, of chemicals and it's in the air, it's, it's vapor. So if you smell a field of flowers, that's VOCs. If you smell the, you walk into a bakery and you smell delicious things, those are VOCs. If you walked into a bakery and you didn't smell something delicious, you'd probably leave. So VOCs aren't bad. They're just things and you need to understand what they are. So we are actually a huge creator of VOCs. If you want to measure VOCs in your house and try and bring them down, um, one thing you might do is like tell your teenagers to start showering more, things like that. Um, staleness is kind of what you get, this kind of odors and smells and things like that. I have two cats, I think I mentioned, in the tiny lab. Guess what it is coming out of their litter box? VOCs. You cannot, by the way, smell their litter box in that 200 square foot tiny house on wheels. And that's not an accident. That was purposeful. And we are not doing crazy stuff in there. Like I told you, I'm an idiot. I don't know how to build crazy stuff. Um, we're just elegantly affecting the pressures, the physics in that space. Now, to get back to the chemistry, though, the higher VOC levels does not mean that room is toxic. If you have a really smelly room, it doesn't mean that it's bad for you health-wise. So it's not a really good measure. If you're measuring VOCs in a home, it's not like telling you, uh-oh, the VOCs are spiking, which means that you're, it's unhealthy. That's not really true. So that's why it's kind of weird. Um, and it turns out that when you take, when, when we all get upset about something that's in a product, generally what they will do is called a regrettable substitution. <laughs> We, they don't, they're not going to call it that. They're going to call it like saving the day, but we'll call it a regrettable substitution. What they do is take a chemical that is very, very closely related, a cousin to the chemical that you don't like, and they'll put that in there instead, which is very dangerous because we don't know anything about the cousin. This is the first time it's ever been used. So now we're all guinea pigs and we wait for 10 or 20 years to find out if that is bad for us. And then we'll find out and then we can either keep it in there or we decide, uh oh, no, we're all upset about BPA or asbestos or, um, you know, brominated tris or chlorinated tris or whatever it is. So this interview that I did on our YouTube channel was 
very, very important for me. Her, her name is Arlene Bloom. She's a mountaineer, actually. She's pretty awesome. Uh, but she has uh, uh, some amazing things to say. And some of the things that we took out of home chem from her, from people like Rich Corsi, are a list of three things to do to control your home chem. Number one, do not bring bad stuff into your home. Now, that does not mean try to research the certifications for products out there. Um, it turns out that the product certifications, like if you get something that's, um, I'm not going to list any of them because I don't want them being upset with me, but I'll, let me suffice it to say that anything that is certified green or certified healthy or anything like that is BS as far as the, the uh, extent of this presentation is talking about. They will focus on one thing. So CARB2 compliant certified is just for formaldehyde. Um, Green Guard Gold is just for VOCs. They're not measuring things like phthalates or uh, microbial encouragement or a reaction with moisture or anything like that. So it's, it's you need to kind of educate yourself. You're, you're on your own here. You can rely on people like me and other people who focus on the science of homes. People at, at uh, Ultra Air and Santa Fe may be able to, to help with some expertise on that as well. Number two thing you can do is ventilate. You must have point exhaust where you create moisture in your home. That's every shower or bathtub and, and your kitchen. And then keep it dry is the number three thing. That's it. If you do those three things, you're likely to have a healthy home. And so ventilation and keeping it dry can be combined in a new home when you have control over stuff like that, which is why we work with Ultra Air in Santa Fe for so long is because this these things are like critical to controlling your home cam, and they happen to at, be at the forefront of this, which is, so obviously they're a fan of the show and, and the messages that we're trying to um, spread. So the heroes of home cam, and this is a picture of my tiny house on wheels, by the way. This is, uh, my wife was a debutante. She, I didn't want her to divorce me at the end of our uh, year of touring around the country. So it's, it's pretty fancy. Uh, number one thing, you must have, you must, kitchen exhaust fan that goes outside just going to let that sink in. That is the most important ingredient. If you only do one thing in your entire life to make your house healthier, it is this. You walk up to your kitchen exhaust head, and if it's, if it's part of a microwave, by the way, if you have microwave over your stove, that won't work. There is no such thing as a microwave integrated exhaust fan that does the things that we recommend you have done with your gases that are being created. And again, the gases are created whether you are using electric stove or induction or whatever. You're creating chemicals, you're creating particles when you cook, period. We will have induction, and that does create the least amount of nitrate radicals, which is nice. Um, but aside from that, it's the same. So kitchen exhaust, super important. Ventilation system, very important. Every new house should be have a dedicated ventilation system. And in fact, that is code in most cities, or excuse me, in most states in the United States of America. Not a lot of builders are doing it because they're not enforced to do it because the building officials aren't <laughs> educated enough because they're underpaid and overworked to know how to enforce it. And so this is something that you really need to educate yourself on because if you're buying a new home, uh, this is not going to be like an obvious, oh, of course it'll have a ventilation system. You got to ask and then you got to make sure that it works by testing it. Dehumidification. Every new house is being built different than every house before now. And I'll show you why in just a minute. But dehumidification is something that every single house should have. There are a bunch of people in my field who agree about that across, and obviously people who sell dehumidifiers would say that. But I'm here as a third party to tell you that this is really important because just in case you have a humidity event, you want to make sure to control that. This house is going to even control it to an extent where I don't even have to use um, like under floor. Uh, we have hardwood floors and they, they have this moisture barrier that they like to put down. Nope, not going to do that. I know exactly what the humidity level in this house is going to be forever. And it's going to be 40 to 50 percent, period, no matter what season. It's also airtight enough, which is something I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, that I won't have the temperature and humidity swings outside affecting the inside of my house. And I'm about to test that on our YouTube channel. I think tomorrow we're going to do the test. Filtration, as I already mentioned, air cleaning should only involve a filter and a fan. Don't fall for these like 
devices, gadgets that you plug in and they do air cleaning for you. If it says ion, it says plasma, it says react, it says destroy, do not buy it. It's doing crazy stuff. You don't, and, and they're not measuring it. Uh, and you don't know what it's going to do because they don't know what chemicals you're going to have in your house to be able to rack with it, right? Vacuums. You need to have a HEPA filtered vacuum. No matter what brand or kind it is, it doesn't matter. I happen to be building a central vacuum into this house. We have a little uh, pig, you know, like a little uh, pull behind uh, vacuum in the tiny house that we use. Both of those are HEPA because if you take the particles that are safely on the ground and then you suck them up into your vacuum and eject them up into the air, now you can breathe them. It was better before you cleaned in your house. It was healthier before you vacuumed with a non-HEPA vacuum. Please don't do that to your family. And last thing is surface washing. And that means water. You talk to people in Europe, what do they clean with? It's not 409 or uh, bleach or whatever it is that we're spraying all over the place because we're crazy about trying to disinfect everything all the time now. It's water and a rag, microfiber if you wanna be fancy. Okay, so this is like very basic stuff. You just wanna try and get, wash the things off. It doesn't matter if you kill the bacteria, just get them off the surface and then they're gone. So consumer particle sensors, some of you might get so excited about this that you go out and you're like, I wanna monitor my air because testing is important. I, I applaud you, good job, testing is important, but you should know that the things that you're about to plug in, which are on this little table here on the right, you can see there's a bunch of different brands that they were testing as a part of this. What they do is they weigh, because you can't put a really expensive sensor into these $100 or a couple hundred dollar gadgets, they're gonna weigh the particle mass. They're not gonna count the particles. So that means that anything that's a PM 2.5, like a big boulder basically, that's 2.5 microns. And then you've got 100 one nanometer particles. And those are way more dangerous because they're gonna go all the way down to your lungs and go straight through into your blood. The two and a half micron boulder, it's is gonna outweigh everything else. So you're only gonna see the big stuff essentially if you use these. Uh, all of your cooking stuff, stovetop, yeah, the toaster even, is creating tiny, tiny, tiny particles, which again are not picked up by this. You might be monitoring and you might say, oh no, it's perfectly healthy in here without a kitchen exhaust hood, even though Corbett said that was the most important thing to do. And I'm not going to install a kitchen exhaust because my, my little consumer particle sensor says that I'm safe. It's not true. So your nose actually turns out to be a fantastic indoor air quality sensor. Um, but you have this thing where you will get used to a smell. You're around it for 10 minutes. Your brain says, okay, 10 minutes is enough. I told you that this smell was here. I'm gonna turn that off for a minute, okay? So you, that's why you'll then feel like, oh, I'm smelling it all over again as I step inside. So here are two images. And if you've never seen this before, what thing that's on the left, that's the door that is replacing my front door on the tiny lab, it's called a blower door, is the most important test you could possibly do on a home. If you're gonna do one test in your entire life, blower door test, that's what you want. Everybody say, blower door test. All right, make your friends say it. Uh, what it does is basically uh, create a, a hole of known size, which is the fan hole, and then we're gonna create a pressure differential between inside and outside, and we're gonna measure how much air goes through the fan. And how much air goes through the fan must be how much air is coming in and out of the house accidentally through all the gaps and cracks. It's basically, that's all, but it is very simple. So the three readouts that you see here 50.3, 51.0, 48.8, those three little pictures. Don't pay attention to the top numbers. That's all around 50. The point is that we take every house in the country to 50 pascals. That's the pressure differential that we always get every house to. It means that we can compare all houses, apples to apples. What you see on the bottom, the first number, 47.1, that is the CFM that's running through my fan. What that means is that if I was to go and get from a home improvement store, a bath exhaust fan, which I just told you is super important, right? Because I am going to create moisture in my shower. And I installed that in this house and I turned it on. The number of CFM that any fan that you'd buy off the shelf would run is probably at least 50 CFM. So the fact that my blower door number is 50 CFM approximately, 47.1, means that every time I use that bath fan, I would be doing essentially a blower door test on my house. Now you should know that a blower door test is a very dangerous thing to do on a house if you haven't set up the house properly. It's like putting your house on a treadmill to test whether it's going to have a heart attack or not. 
And if you do that every day when you take a shower, you're gonna make your, my house would be a mold fest if I had a bath exhaust fan installed in this house. I do not. What I have instead is a balanced ventilation system, which is an interesting way to do it. You can also do supply only, which is in unbalanced, but it's on the positive side where I'm pushing air into the house and, and making air go out through all my gaps and cracks all the time. And you can do that with ultra air dehumidifying uh, ventilators. So that's the one thing is that this is what all houses are going to become down the line. They're going to become this airtight because we, you, you can't help it. There's something that, that now that's a, a spray aerosol that you can just build a house like you used to as floppy as you want. And then you come in at the very end, you spend a couple thousand dollars and you spray this aerosol all over the house and it air seals everything for you to the point where you get as airtight as my house is, which I spent a lot of time getting to. That is to say that Number one, code is requiring your houses are being built airtight. If you buy a new house, it's going to be more airtight than before. Also, we want it to be airtight. That's a good thing. But when you do that, now you have to pay special attention to the physics, the imbalance that happens when you introduce suction on your house. That where is the air coming from? Conversation becomes very important. Second number, 1.39. That means that I did more than twice as good as any builder will ever be required to build as far as air tightness minimums go in the entire country. And this was the first house I ever built. And I already told you, I'm an idiot about building. I had to learn to use a nail gun to build this house. Any builder could do a better job than me, period, if they actually wanted to, which they don't, because they don't think you want it and you're willing to pay for it and wait for it. You should be. Third number there is passive house. 0.047 is 5% uh, CFM per square foot of the enclosure, that's a passive house. That's the tightest building certification in the world. And I met this, my first house that I ever built. On the right is my new house, which I'm sitting in right now. It is 15 times bigger than my tiny house on square footage. And it's actually, let's see, it's about 20 times bigger on volume. And my blower door number is only six times more. So this house is way, way more airtight than the tiny lab even is. And we went so crazy with testing that we actually simulated a hurricane on this house just to make sure that we know exactly what would happen if we had what's called wind-driven rain hitting this house. You can see that there are no eaves in this picture. It's because we bolted the eaves on after we did all this stuff. It was a pretty insane process. You can see all that on our YouTube channel. So this is when you need testing to be able to get to this all these goals that we're talking about here. Number one, if you have a complex problem at home and you want it solved, that means you're not a first-time homeowner. If you're a first-time homeowner and you've been in your house for a month, you think that you could do the job and then you're gonna hire your brother-in-law to do it because he knows a little bit about houses. You're gonna hire a cheap contractor and then finally, five years later, you're gonna get your act together and you're gonna hire a contractor who can really fix the problem and prove that it's done. They're gonna do that with testing. If you're planning any home improvements, including additions, renovations, bath, remodels, anything like that, and you wanna make sure that you're taking advantage of all the opportunities in your home to tune it properly, testing, testing is the answer. If you're building or buying a home and you want to make sure you're not getting a lemon, you should have testing done. Okay, so all this testing will give you the ability to analyze and to predict and to prevent all the side effects that are not favorable for you. If a side effect that's uh, favorable for you is that your house is um, up close to the outdoor temperature all the time because you grew up living in a cave uh, in Siberia, Great, no problem. You don't have to do any of this stuff. And and so, you know, that's one thing. But if you want to be able to uh, both have entire walls of glass and be able to walk around in your underwear all the time because this is America and I get to do what I want, then you need to like start paying attention to some stuff. If you're gonna buy a new home, you gotta pay attention to this. So here's me looking very serious. And it's because the costume that I'm trying to show off is very serious. So the, what you need people to be doing is using tools and using techniques, which is why I wrote the book, to use those tools to give you an inspection, look at what the problem is, then run diagnostics, then open their mouth and tell you what you need. You have anybody walk into your house and look at, or hear your description of a problem, look at it and then say, oh, well, what you need is blah, blah, blah. This is, I've seen this a million times before. No, that does not work. That is not science. That is just guessing which I see all the time, and those are my clients. Those are the kinds of people that I end up going to because they're like, ah, I hired five contractors in a row and none of them fixed the problem. What is the deal? And it literally takes me two hours to find out what's going on. So this is an example of what you would learn in the television show. I'm just gonna play this short PSA. 
Home Diagnosis isn't aiming for homes to be built higher performance. .com. There is my email. There is my cell phone number. Um, I'm going to take questions in a minute. So as you're you know, sitting there thinking about what we've been pondering, go ahead and type your questions in. Make sure that you get those in. We're going to start addressing questions in a minute. Um, but suffice it to say that I have lots of information that I would love to give you for free. You can download what's called our Genius Booklet, which is our Proof is Possible uh, booklet. To, it's a 24-page full-color uh, book that it took a while to put together. We, we spent a year trying to make this thing perfect. And we think that it's one of the best crash courses on home performance. I also have an actual crash course that's like a video four module course that you can get through our uh, any of our websites, either homediagnosis.tv or home, uh, buildingperformanceworkshop.com. I have more in-depth courses. I do video consulting uh, long distance. We're just basically trying to get people out there to understand how to use these tools and techniques to make their homes healthier places and to make sure that you get the bang for your buck that you're spending on homes because, geez, are they expensive. Okay, Jenny, I will go ahead and take some questions if you've got them. Um, right now, this time we don't have any questions, but we can just wait a few more moments um, for people to type them in. Great. And if you guys don't have any questions, which happens to me uh, more than you would imagine, uh, that's fine. I hope that I've addressed a bunch of um, like high-level things and also exactly how, you know, how to use some of these things to start making strides in your home. Um, I will just say for a moment that uh, like all dehumidifiers are good. The difference between Santa Fe and Ultra Air, as, as I have experienced it, and I know that the company is constantly evolving, um, Santa Fe are like standalone dehumidifiers. If you want to plug and play uh, dehumidifier that you can just buy, put in your house, and it's going to dehumidify your entire basement, uh, that's fine. That's the Santa Fe version. If you want something that's going to be more of a system that's going to plug into, like ours is, plugged into our HVAC, our heating and cooling ductwork, that's where the Ultra Air comes in. And Ultra Air also introduces the ability to bring in fresh outdoor air that then gets filtered up to a MERV 13, which is a pretty high filtration level. So you're getting kind of the two-in-one there where you're getting drying and the mechanical ventilation of the fresh air diluting the indoor contaminants at the same time. So we haven't had any questions come in, so I think we can conclude this webinar. And Corbett has um, the screen up with his contact information. And I think that concludes the webinar. Thank you, Corbett. Fantastic. Thank you.